All right. So, uh, hey, Ron, my name is Austin. I'm a master's student in the Cook Lab. And today I'm just going to be talking about a project I did last summer, which is titled Chill Out, Assisting Post-Capture Recovery in Angled Rainbow Trout. So first I'll just introduce the premise of catch and release, um, which is that released fish that they survive and um, they survive and do well to be caught another day. And however, this isn't always the case and catch and release events that don't end in mortality, they can still negatively impact fish without killing them. Um, and since angling is such a popular activity worldwide, it's really important that there is uh, research that one determines the impacts of angling on these fish, as well as the steps that anglers can take to mitigate them. Um, so there are three main angling stressors that are commonly identified um, when a fish is captured. And in each of these stressors, um, the anglers themselves actually have a large influence on the magnitude of their impacts on the fish. And small changes to how an angler behaves can really impact uh, the amount of stress a fish experiences. So good examples are to decrease fight times, to use barbless hooks, and to keep the fish in the water. And these are all recommendations that can um, alleviate stress and mitigate our impact on the fish. So when we study post, when we study catch and release, um, there's a lot of science that's focused on post-release behavior. Um, this is because usually after a fish is released, it needs some time to recover from being captured. And during this time, they can exhibit some behavioral impairments. And this is usually easily observable and as well as a, a good indicator of the physiological stress that the fish is experiencing. Um, so here's just a short video of what a behaviorally impaired fish looks like. Um, so a common thing that a lot of anglers will see is equilibrium loss or belly up behavior. And when faced with this situation, um, the community has recommended a bunch of tactics that are supposed to help the fish, um, such as holding the fish in the current if you're in a river or if you're in a lake, dragging the fish around in a figure eight pattern. Um, both of these methods are supposed to facilitate the flow of oxygen over the gills and um, help the fish recover better. However, there's been a bunch of science um, surrounding how effective these measures actually are at helping fish recover. And it's been pretty mixed in success. And it seems to be dependent on the environmental factors as well as the type of fish that's being caught. So the goal of my project was to determine um, the efficacy of two of these assisted recovery methods um, for reducing post-release behavioral impairment. Uh, we studied rainbow trout at the Canuck Institute and Canuck Nature, which is a large game reserve, fish and game reserve in Quebec. Um, so how I went about studying post-release behavior was through the use of um, triaxial accelerometer tags. And these were attached externally using a new technique that um, I developed and named the fish bit. So you can see here the tag is in white and it's glued onto a little piece of um, plexiglass. And then we cut two small slits in the plexiglass and threaded a piece of Velcro tape through. And then this just allowed us to wrap the entire thing around the fish like a bracelet and stick the Velcro together. Um, and this fits the tag securely on the fish. And you could see in the previous picture, there's a small uh, metal riveted hole on one end. And here we clipped a fishing line to it. And then you get your undergrad assistant to hold the rod while the fish swims away. And you could see there while um, the reel is actually in the open position. And so the fish is swimming away, kind of like being on a leash, um, but there's no resistance on the fish. And once we're done, um, our trial period for this study was around 10 minutes. Uh, once we're done, we can just tighten up on the, uh, we can just close the bale, which tightens the line. And then that peels the Velcro off wherever the fish is in the water. And then we can just reel the whole thing in to get the data back and the fish can swim off wherever it is. And overall, I think this um, method reduced the stress that um, our study individuals faced. Uh, we could attach these things on the fish to, uh, shorter than 30 seconds and we eliminated the need to recapture the fish to get the data back which again is a very stressful uh, situation for the fish so for the project we looked at two different uh, methods of assisted recovery the first was a flow box and these are these have been started to be used in um, salmon fisheries for recovering salmon that they want to release um, but they're exhausted and what it is is just a wooden water-filled box with a uh, pump at one end with flowing water and drainage at the other. And the second method was just a cooler that was filled with water um, 
for each fish. And you can see there the fish is just having a nice little nap. Um, and at the, what we also did was we varied the temperature of water that was used in both these methods. Um, so either we pumped water from the surface of the lake, which is around 25 degrees Celsius, or we sunk the pump to around 15 degrees, uh, 15 feet deep. And this gave us water that was around 17 Celsius. And this was really interesting because of the fact that 25 degrees is around the upper lethal limit for temperature wise for the rainbow trout. And 17 was close to their optimal range, um, their optimal like working range. And so it was interesting to see how not just the recovery methods, um, how that influenced recovery, but also how the temperature itself. Uh, so here's just a breakdown again of what we did. Uh, so we varied the recovery method, either the flow box, the cooler, or just immediate release. We varied the recovery temperature. And we also varied the amount of air exposure the um, fish received to simulate like a typical angling event. And we measured two things. The first was the time to regain equilibrium. So how quickly the fish uh, flipped over and swam away on its own after release. And the second being overall dynamic body acceleration or ODBA. Uh, this is just a measure of total swimming activity and it's measured by the tags. So what did we find? The first thing was, and the most significant thing was that we found that um, fish that received assisted recovery, either in the flow box or the cooler, they regained equilibrium quicker compared to those that were immediately released. And additionally, the ones that were held in that cold water when we pumped the cold 17 degree water up, they regained equilibrium the quickest of all groups. Um, you can see there in graphs B and C, the fastest times regain equilibrium were the box, the cooler, and the cold water treatments. Uh, secondly, for swimming activity, we found that there was a, a little, a bit of an interactive effect between the recovery method used and the amount of air exposure the fish received. Um, so you can see here that at 30 seconds of air exposure, um, the ODPA values, the swimming activity values were higher compared to those were higher in fish that were assisted versus those that were immediately released. And this trend was only apparent at that 30 second group. It wasn't, um, so for the zero and 15 seconds, um, there was no difference between those. And this could indicate that at the highest levels of stress, um, assisted recovery is more beneficial compared to when um, the fish are not as stressed. Uh, however, there's a lot of work to be done to find potential links between swimming activity and physiological stress. So what is unknown is whether or not high ODPA values indicate high stress or vice versa. And so on to the key points, the first being that assisted recovery in the cold water, um, assisted recovery in general, especially in the cold water, it significantly reduced the equilibrium impairment on the trout. Um, trout that were air exposed for 30 seconds, they were more active after they received assisted recovery compared to those that were immediately released. And lastly, the big take home message is that assisted recovery um, through either method could be beneficial when the fish are belly up uh, upon landing. And there's our, there are environmental factors that could make immediately releasing them risky. And uh, by this, I mean that uh, we identified three different risks, the first being predators. So we noticed that when we released fish that were belly up, they were more enticing to like the seagulls and ospreys, they were targeted more often. And there's actually um, some studies on this in the marine environment where researchers have found that fish that are released without equilibrium are more likely to be eaten by sharks. Um, the second is current. So although we did our study in lakes, um, a lot of trout fishing is done in rivers. And so you could imagine that fish that are received that are released belly up in a river, they're more susceptible to being um, flushed downstream due to flow. And this could injure them as well as if they're on a migration route, it could cause them to increase their energetic costs by causing them to have to swim back up the same stretch river. And lastly, warm water. Um, in, again, in the lakes that we caught the fish at, the surface water temperatures were significantly higher than what is normal and preferred for trout. And the fish that we did observe die, they floated on the surface um, for the entirety of the trial. And this, we hypothesized that it, they could have died due to overheating. Um, so fish that are unable to flip over and swim down by themselves, they can't reach that cold water and they're stuck in that warm water. And so lastly, let's talk about the role of anglers and all of this. Um, so to the fish, this all this catch and release science is only beneficial if the anglers are willing to alter the behavior based on the studies. 
And so integrating survey-based studies, um, like Alice was talking about earlier, with conventional catch-release research, it can really help determine which recommendations are most readily adopted. And this research needs to be widely shared to a broad audience in uh, easily digestible formats in order to be effective and in order to sway the angular opinion on uh, these issues. And a good example of this is organization Keep Fish Wet. And what they do is they advocate for all these different proper handling practices and they share the science that supports their recommendations. And with that, I'd like to thank my co-authors, Jess, Pete, Leanne, Jake, Andy, and Steve, as well as the partners Canock Nature and UMass Amherst.